The sermon today is taken from Exodus 12, uh, verses 1 to 28. This is the word of God. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then... They shall take some of the blood and put it on on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you, and the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for for if anyone eats what is leavened uh, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those, t- those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you. And you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month, at the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of, pers- congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat un- nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel on, and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of the house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. The Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised you, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by the service? You shall say, it is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he has passed over the houses of the peoples of Israel and Egypt. When he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did, thus says the Lord. Thank you. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Passover. Thank you for the Lord's Supper, Lord, which Passover symbolized. We ask, O Lord, that you would bless your word to the hearing of our hearts and that you would anoint us, O Lord, uh, as your word is preached. Um, We ask these things in the name of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
In Genesis chapter 22, we find Abraham walking up a hill with his son, his only son, Isaac, whom he loves. If you're at all familiar with this story, you'll remember that Abraham had been commanded by God to sacrifice Isaac in the place of an animal on Mount Moriah as a burnt offering for sin. And the scripture tells us that Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his donkey and gathered Isaac and two of his servants and headed towards the mountain. On the third day, as Abraham looked up, he saw the place in the distance and said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over and worship and return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon his son, Isaac. And he took in his hand fire and the knife. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, in astonishment, My father. And Abraham said, Here I am, my son. And Isaac said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered and said, My son, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. As Abraham reached out his hand to slaughter his son, The Lord promptly stopped the sacrifice and provided a ram in its place. Mercifully, the ram was slaughtered instead of Isaac. And from that day forward, we're told that prophetically, Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. But just what would it be that the Lord himself would provide in the future for the descendants of Abraham. Well, a careful reading of both the Old and New Testament tells us that it's a lamb, a lamb. The Lord would provide the true lamb somewhere near Mount Moriah in the region of Jerusalem. And that lamb would be God's very own son. The true lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, he himself in a future time would carry the wood for the burnt offering on his back up the very hill of Calvary in order to die for the sins of his people by absorbing the fire of God's wrath on their behalf. And being very familiar with the story of their father Abraham, the Hebrews knew that the real Lamb of God would one day come and die in their place as a true sacrifice for sin. So the Hebrews living in Egypt during the time of the Passover must have understood that God would send his son to make satisfaction for sin as they slaughtered an innocent lamb and were protected from the lambs, from the wrath of God by the lamb's blood. They also knew that the true lamb of God would come someday and shed his blood in order to provide satisfaction for sin and protection from God's wrath. So the Passover, the purpose of it was to make sure that the Hebrews understood that the basis of their salvation was a bloody sacrifice to appease or satisfy the wrath of God. And although the Hebrews were saved from the physical effects of all the recent plagues, they still needed to understand the true way of salvation. They needed that to be made clear to them. You see, the way of salvation for the Hebrews in the Old Testament 
is exactly the same way of salvation for believers in the New Testament as well. As they look forward to the sacrificial death of the coming Lamb of God for sinners through the Passover celebration, so we also look backwards to the very same death of the Lamb of God and celebrate it through our participation in the Lord's Supper. So the exodus from Egypt is not just an account of an ordinary night one day in human history. No, the exodus from Egypt teaches us that Jesus Christ, the true Passover lamb, the lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world. So far in the exodus narrative, there have been nine plagues, nine plagues, nine times that God has personally appealed to Pharaoh through the signs and wonders to let his people go that they might worship him. And each time, however, Pharaoh hardened his heart and refused to let God's people go. And so the intensity of the plagues rises each time Pharaoh breaks his promise to Moses. And the tenth plague, the final plague, the Passover plague, will be the most dreadful and deadliest plague of all, being inflicted by God himself personally, forcing Pharaoh to drive the Hebrews out of Egypt altogether. Now, this tells us that the Passover itself was indeed a plague. The Passover was the tenth and final plague. And Exodus chapter 11 tells us exactly what this plague is. Verse 4, chapter 11 So the Lord said to Moses, about midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be a loud wailing throughout all of Egypt worse than there ever has been or ever will be. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any man or an animal, then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. But just what is this distinction that the Lord is going to make between Egypt and Israel? Will he only plague the Egyptians as he did from the fourth plague onward and not the Israelites? Not really. You see, the effects of the tenth plague extended throughout the entire land of Egypt, including the land where the Hebrews lived. The difference, however, was that certain households were covered by the blood of the Lamb, causing the Lord to mercifully pass by them while all others suffered his judgment. And so the Passover narrative in Exodus chapter 12 teaches us some very important lessons about how sinners are saved from the wrath of God. In other words, Passover teaches us three very important lessons about salvation itself. Three very important lessons about salvation itself. First, the Passover teaches us that salvation comes through judgment. Salvation comes through judgment. Second, the Passover teaches us that salvation comes through sacrifice. Salvation comes through sacrifice. And third, the Passover teaches us that salvation comes through substitution. Salvation comes through substitution. But first... Salvation through judgment. Look at verse 12 with me. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment upon all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. You see, as we saw earlier, the Passover was the tenth and final plague. A plague that brought judgment to those whose homes were left uncovered by the blood of the lamb. 
And at the same time, that same Passover brought salvation to the homes that were covered by the blood of the Lamb. So while Passover itself was a plague to some, at the very same time, it was salvation to others. You may remember the story of Noah's Ark in Genesis chapter 7, where God is described as being grieved after seeing that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. And that every thought and intent of his heart was only evil continually. God then decided to destroy all the inhabitants of the earth, both men and beasts, with the exception of Noah and his family. And at that very same time that the judgment of God fell upon the entire earth, Noah, his family, and the elect animals, of course, were being saved through the ark as it covered them from the floodwaters of God's wrath. So we can clearly see that salvation, the Bible teaches that salvation comes through judgment. Salvation is always through judgment. You know, as Christians, we, just like the Old Testament saints, weren't saved around judgment or away from judgment But we were saved through judgment. You see, the judgment that we deserve fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is our true Passover lamb, who himself absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. And so the Passover saves through judgment. But what did the Passover save the Hebrews from? Or what does the Passover save us from? Well, one answer is that the Passover saved the Hebrews from all the false gods of Egypt. You see, the Israelites had experienced over 400 years of slavery and servitude, worshiping the false gods of Egypt. And they were immersed, therefore, in Egyptian culture, ideology, and their customs. They were hopelessly, therefore, indoctrinated and infatuated with Egypt. So their salvation was about more than just their physical oppression and slavery in Egypt. They were also spiritually oppressed and enslaved to sin. They needed saving. In other words, from themselves. They needed saving from themselves. You know, I became a Christian in 1998 at the age of 26. And the moment I was converted, I'll never forget how it felt like I was transformed from one life to another. I was the same person physically, but I was different inwardly mentally, and emotionally. And as I reflected after my conversion upon the first 26 years of my life before I was converted, I realized just how much I had been immersed in the culture and the ideology and the customs of my day. I had been thoroughly absorbed in all sorts of false beliefs about life, about myself, about God, about everything, I was spiritually oppressed and enslaved to sin. I needed saving from myself, from myself. You see, salvation is about more than just physical or political or economic liberation. No, salvation is primarily about Liberation of the soul, the liberation from spiritual oppression. But there's something even more important that the Hebrews and you and me needed saving from than just our own sinfulness and spiritual blindness, right? There's something even more important that the Hebrews needed saving from. What we ourselves and the Hebrews really need saving from is God himself. 
You see, God himself needs to save sinners from his wrath. Look at verses 12, 13, and 27 with me. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. Verse 13, when I strike the land of Egypt. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians. Three times it's repeated in these verses that it's the Lord who's coming in judgment. Why? Because the judgment itself is personal. The judgment of God itself is personal. Sinners have sinned against God and abused and rebelled against his authority. So God's judgment against sinners is very personal. You see, unlike all the previous plagues, all of Israel, including Moses himself, must take shelter under the blood because God himself will visit Egypt in judgment. This time, neither Moses nor Aaron shall be as gods to Pharaoh because this particular judgment is a direct act of God. Being sinners, the Hebrews themselves deserved no less to die, no less than the firstborn sons of Egypt. And so do you and I. So while the Hebrews were being saved by God, They themselves needed saving from God. Salvation, if it's going to come, has to be a salvation from God. Sinners need to be saved both by God and from God. Salvation through judgment. Salvation through judgment. And that brings us to our second point, which is salvation through sacrifice. Salvation through sacrifice. You see, not only was the Passover lamb to be eaten, but it also functioned as a sacrifice. And the most important aspect of a sacrifice is its blood. The blood. You remember uh, when Cain killed his brother Abel, and God confronted Cain and he said to him, Your brother's blood cries out from the ground to me. The blood. So blood is what prevents judgment. Verse 23. For the Lord will pass through and strike the Egyptians when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the doorposts. And the Lord himself will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You see, it's the blood of the lamb that makes all the difference. When blood is in our veins, it's a sign of life. Blood is outside of our veins. It's a sign of sure and certain death. And the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the Hebrews was a sign that a sacrificial death had already occurred there. And that's what prevented the judgment of God from falling upon those households. It was the blood. And only the blood. Whosoever was without the blood of the lamb forfeited the blood of his very own firstborn. If sinners are going to be saved from God, then judgment must fall upon a sacrifice. The judgment must fall upon a sacrifice. You see, salvation doesn't happen apart from judgment or away from judgment, but through judgment. And that judgment must fall on a sacrifice, the innocent lamb. And that's what happened at Passover. And it's also what happened at the cross of Calvary. The cross was the ultimate judgment of the world. Focus down like a magnifying glass until it burned with the fire of God's wrath upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who was our all-too-willing sacrifice. 
But that's how sacrifice, that's how salvation comes. Only through judgment falling upon the sacrifice. It's blood for blood, life for life, death for death. You know, the Israelites were not spared from God's judgment by their own merits because they prayed or fasted, but only because they applied the blood that was shed exactly the way God instructed. You see, God made it crystal clear to the Hebrews what was necessary in order for them to escape his judgment. Verse 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You see what this is saying? That unless the Israelites met God's conditions, they too would experience the loss of their firstborn just like the Egyptians. This is what makes Moses and the Israelites no different from the Egyptians. They too had to apply the blood that was shed. And so each family had to apply the shed blood of the lamb to the doorposts and to remain inside their homes. And then, and only then, would their firstborn be spared from death. So the faithful application of the blood of the lamb was the only means of safety. The blood declared that God's wrath had already been absorbed by the death of a substitute. Although Christ shed his blood for the sin of the world, no one is ever saved from judgment unless he or she personally trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You see, it's not enough to simply know facts or details or even to know that Jesus Christ's blood was shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. You must per- personally embrace that for yourself what Christ has made available to you by trusting, receiving, and resting on him alone for salvation. Forgiveness and reconciliation with God are attained by faith alone. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, it was not until the blood had been applied in this way that it actually provided protection from God's wrath. You must apply the blood. There must be genuine faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you trusting in anything else other than the blood of Christ that was shed for you on the cross of Calvary? You know, I can only imagine that in some of those households, people were afraid and nervously wondering on that day when the angel of death passed by, nervously wondering to themselves whether or not the blood of the ram, lamb would really make a difference. And as they heard the horror of what was going on around them, they must have had doubts. Will it save? Will it save? But you see, assurance of salvation is not based upon a person's doubts or feelings. Rather, it's based on God's promises and on God's promises alone. You see, despite their doubts, when the angel of death saw the blood on the houses, he mercifully passed by. So likewise, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, You are a child of God and have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, whether you feel like it or not. You see, it's not about how much faith you have in Christ's blood. You are saved because the blood itself is infinitely sufficient to save you. Both strong and weak faith in the blood of Christ leads to exactly the same outcome, salvation. Thank God 
that we are not saved by the quality or the quantity of our faith, but by the genuineness of it. So salvation through judgment. Salvation through judgment, salvation through sacrifice, and finally, salvation through substitution. Salvation through substitution. The Hebrews were saved by substitution. Look at the last line of verse 30. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Did you know that that was true of every house in Egypt during the night of the Passover? That whether Egyptian or Hebrew, there was a death that occurred in the home. Every house has someone dead in it. Either there was a dead lamb or a dead human being. If there wasn't a dead lamb, there was certainly a dead person. Are you now beginning to see how Passover taught salvation through substitution? Salvation comes by way of a substitutionary sacrifice. A sacrifice that stands in the place of sinners. A sacrifice that takes both your place and mine. Do you think that after an entire night of hearing the sounds of weeping, wailing, and mourning, that the Hebrews themselves were grateful that the lamb had died in their place? Imagine the gratitude then that we should feel towards the Lord Jesus Christ, the true lamb of God who willingly died as our substitute. You see, Jesus voluntarily laid down his life while we were yet sinners and his enemies. In fact, he freely took on the form of a human being and was humiliated and oppressed in order to follow the will of the Father to die be- and become a sacrifice for our sins. Listen to Philippians chapter 2. He, that is Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself, and becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. You see, on the cross of Calvary, the Lord became the Lamb, the Savior became the sacrifice. The judge became the judged. And the creator himself was crucified, slaughtered as a lamb. He bled the blood of God that was shed for both you and me. It's salvation by substitution. The blood of God shed for his people. You know, there is rapidly approaching a day of judgment in the future for all human beings. And there is blood that is rightfully required to God from each and every last one of us for every sin that we've ever committed. Praise be to God that Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, has acted on our behalf as our sacrifice. And now... The blood that God rightfully should demand from us has already been given for us in our place, on our behalf, as our substitute. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, then his blood also shelters you from the coming day of judgment. And if you're not, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the true Lamb of God. And there's nothing that could shelter you from that day. So the question is, 
Are you covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? Was his death on the cross for you? Have you taken hold of it by faith? You see, Jesus, the Lamb of God, sits on the throne right now, this very moment, waiting to receive all of those who come to him by faith. His blood is sufficient, infinitely sufficient, to cover all who come to him by faith from the wrath of an almighty God. Let us take comfort in the words of Augustus Top Lady's hymn that says, Payment God will not twice demand from my bleeding surety's hand and then again from my. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have given your son, Lord, your very own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God for our salvation. We pray, O oh Lord, that if there's any here today, O oh Lord, who have, who have not yet clung to him in faith, in genuine faith, that you would open their hearts and bless them to do so. Thank you, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.